name is J. Christopher Hamilton. I am an attorney and professor, and I'm going to be presenting today on a research project that I put together entitled Cryptocurrency and Crowdfunding, a new kind of to film finance. Hope you find the presentation um, informative and helpful. And if you'd like to be updated on things, my presentations, my talks, my seminars, my boot camps, my 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 um, industry interviews, be sure to follow me at the Brooklyn Boardroom on YouTube. The Brooklyn Boardroom, just follow and subscribe. You'll be updated. Uh, check out some of the past interviews and material. And also, if you want to stay up to speed on what I'm doing, be sure to follow me on one of the social media platforms. The, the um, handle is B-K-L-Y-N Boardroom. That's B-K-L-Y-N Boardroom. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, as, and, as well as YouTube, as I mentioned, but on YouTube, it's the Brooklyn Boardroom. Or email me or go to the website. My website address is brooklynboardroom.com or you can go to B-K-L-Y-N Boardroom.com and email me at, email me at brooklynboardroom.com. That's, <laughs> that's a lot of material, a lot of places to touch, to touch, connect with me. So hopefully you guys uh, take advantage of that. Anyway, why don't we get started on the presentation? So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, it's all queued up, ready to go. So let's jump into crowdfunding and cryptocurrency, new conduits of film finance. So as many of you may be aware, there's been an explosion in the growth of premium content over the past few years. Um, you know, <clears throat> and it's a global explosion. This is This graph is showing you some of the um, amounts of money premium content has generated since 2015. One thing to be mindful of is that, you know, by 2022, premium content will have grown, is it projected to grow to about $47.9 billion just for the film industry alone. So this is, we're looking at all content here, you know, film, television, but premium content. But the subsector of that, which is the film industry, will have grown to 47.9 billion by 2022. This is gonna slightly outpace the US economy. Now, a large portion of that growth is gonna be in the superhero film space or just genre films, like Fast and Furious, action adventure genre, or, um, you know, superhero films like Avengers. And this, gra this graphic is showing you some of the amounts of money these films have generated over the past few years. 357 million domestic alone for Avengers. Um, the other one, uh, The Force Awakens, 247 million. Again, this is the domestic opening weekend. Now, most of these films have broken a billion dollars, but this is just some sense of the, the scale of revenue generation genre films create for the studios. Now, it, you know, it goes without saying there's with this pandemic, there's a dark cloud over Hollywood right now or just over any kind of theatrical experience because theaters are closed. So box offices have plunged 70 percent. Tim polls are being delayed in terms of the releasing and uh, production and releasing of new films. Media theater chains are experiencing really, really uh, difficult economic challenges and having to shut down. So, so there's no question right now that our business is under some serious financial constraints. And prior to that, I mean, even before we got to the place of COVID, there were already challenges happening in the marketplace. You know, there's this global market or global demand for premium content. And we were, our ecosystem was already in, engaged in a battle to, um, to, to, to survive. I mean, there's a lot of businesses in our ecosystem that are challenged with the ability to stay profitable and stay competitive, right? This is an example of how our ecosystem is cannibalizing itself, right? You have cord cutting, which means basically the major media cable providers are losing tons and tons of revenue because subscribers no longer want to pay these exorbitant cable bills. They'd rather just go to streaming services. But also these uh, pay TV provide, these cable providers are part of huge media conglomerates that own both cable networks 
and cable subscription companies, and they're fighting with the streaming services and each other for eyeballs, for viewership. So they're, they're engaged in what we call the streaming wars or this arms race of spending in order to, to maintain a dominance in the marketplace. So production budgets for shows are mushrooming like to hundreds of millions of dollars per episode, where years ago was a fraction of that. Now also, another example of how the ecosystem is cannibalizing itself, the streaming services are buying up rights to a lot of the independent films or the smaller films that are being released for their, because they have to service their, their, their eco their own ecosystems when it comes to the SPOT services or the over the top services. But doing that is really putting a lot of pressure on independent distributors in the theatrical feature space and putting them out of business. So, and not to mention, again, at the end of this crazy chain of events are the theater chains, the actual, the actual exhibitors that are in more and more pressure because the streaming services, as well as the major studios, no longer want to continue with these long exhibition windows of three months. They much rather exhibit content during a shorter period of time so they can monetize it on their platforms. So again, just showing you how the industry in of itself is eating at each other, eating, eating at itself, competing between tech companies, cable companies, independent distributors, theater chains, they're all fighting for survival right now in this really, really challenged um, ecosystem and, and uh, business landscape. What does that do? What does that mean for the small indie film budget? You know, I mean, how does how does the how does this all play out with indie producers as well as these big franchise film studios? It's it's not good. There's less money available, which means that you know the big production companies and the studios have to look elsewhere for to offset some of the expenses, and then the small indie indie producers are left with very few options to find distributors that would willing to help finance their projects. So we'll look at before we get into some of the challenges, let's look at, you know, the reality of the traditional model for financing, debt financing, which is where you have banks lending money to studios and filmmakers, you have equity financing, which is where, you know, in exchange for ownership in a film property, a a, a um, investor will give, you know, the studio or the, um, the filmmaker money. Then you have farm pre-sales, which entails taking a portion of the film rights for a particular territory and selling them in return, meaning the distribution rights, selling them in return for commitment for capital. Now the bank financing is pretty straightforward and customary and the major studios and streamers have access to a lot of capital in this space. I'm giving you some examples of this graphic where Netflix has up to 750 million, it may be even more now. Uh, Legendary has a credit line of a billion dollars to produce content. But, you know, these, it, you know, the, the access to this kind of capital through debt doesn't come with its own disadvantages. Gap financing is another dynamic of closing the budget for a film project. This is particularly relevant for independent film projects. As I mentioned earlier, the major bank loans just really aren't enough. You know, the studios need to find financing partners to offset some of these losses, especially considering, I mean, offset some of this, the, the debt obligations, especially considering now that Chinese investment isn't what it used to be. You know, a few years ago, there was a, a huge um, presence, a uh, huge presence of Chinese companies investing in, in US films, investing in major studio slates, but that's dried up for a variety of reasons, primarily things that happened more related to the Chinese regulatory authorities. You don't have these, the, the, the money from China anymore, so studios are trying to figure out other ways to offset that loss. So the traditional financing challenges tend to relate to, for the Indies, lack of access and collateral for bank financing. The Indie financiers can't go to a bank and say, hey, I wanna get, I want a loan for 20, $20 $30 million for my project. 
uh, they're going to say, well, what's your collateral? And then they're going to say, well, I don't have any collateral. Then they're going to expect the indie finances to go shop around uh, and do some farm pre-sale deals, meaning selling portion a portion of their rights to their film, distributing in a certain territory, and use that as collateral, more bank financing. But as I mentioned in this uh, graphic, this farm pre-sales requires a lot of, of coordinating and a lot of jumping through hurdles in order to secure not even the full budget for your film. And even if you are able to do that for indie, the funds typically do not get released until right before production. So you have tons of development costs that don't get addressed in that process. So again, just one more slide to explain how the pre-sales market works. Indie producers who can't secure production loan for their financing sell a portion of their film rights to a particular territory. Let's say, for example, you have a distributor in, in Argentina or, or that covers all of Latin America. You would sell them a portion of the, you put sell them the right to distribute in Latin America in return for a, an investment in the project, maybe two million, three million, whatever. But they don't give you the full amount. They give you a percentage of what they're going to pay you once the film is delivered. And then that percentage is then used as collateral for your bank loan. But you're also, again, if you're in any space, you're also going to need to secure a completion bond for your film, which also requires uh, spending additional money as additional time and additional hurdles. So the path for indie, fi indie filmmakers trying to secure financing is, is riddled with complications and hurdles and it's extremely cost prohibitive as well as for major studios because the studios who take, who take out these huge bank loans from these lending institutions these credit facilities have to pay tons of interest on these loans so that's why they tend to look for outside capital so let's talk a little bit about some of the new financing models that have emerged some more practical than others depending upon whether you have a major film or you have a, a small budget film so donation-based crowdfunding is one of them. That's where you know people donate money for nothing in return because they believe in the film. Equity crowdfunding is where people get equity or, or institutions or, or companies receive equity ownership, i.e. ownership in your film in return for their investment. And crypto crowdfunding, I mean, cryptocurrency crowdfunding, which is kind of a combination between the two. So donation-based crowdfunding, what does that look like? Well, basically, you, if you're an independent filmmaker, you go to one of these uh, platforms and there's a, there's a myriad of them out there, there's a ton. And what they'll do is they will host your campaign in return for a portion of the money you raise for the film. And in some cases it could be 5%, in some cases it could be 10%. It really does vary. It really, this approach is helpful when you need startup capital. Uh, especially if you're trying to finance through farm pre-sales, you have no money to invest in a, in, in um, establishing that strategy. But you're going to need lawyers. You're going to need you know all kinds of pre uh, marketing materials. So the crowdfunding path is is one way to do that. However, a third of the projects fail to meet their goal. This is a very very challenging path to take if you don't have the right project. And when I speak of the right project, I mean a celebrity-backed project or a project with a real pro-social agenda. These are the projects that te seem to do really well. Some of you may be familiar with Veronica Mars. You know, Kristen Bell raised $5.7 million for this particular project. I mean, she's a celebrity and it, it makes perfect sense. And then they, in return for the fundraising, they, they the, the, um, the, the fund, I mean, the, the producers oftentimes will give all kinds of perks in exchange for your donation. Again, you don't get any ownership as an, so you're not investing in ownership in a film. You're just doing this because you love or believe in the project. So same thing with Spike Lee. So maybe you'll get, you know, coffee mug in this case, you know, one of these projects, they got a chance to sit down and get their own script critique by the film director. Another case, maybe you get, you know, a speaking role in the film. It all depends. But the point is, this is a potential path for the right property, but not all properties would be an effective, um, effective for crowdfunding. 
donation-based crowdfunding. Equity crowdfunding is where the film investor gets a piece of ownership in the property in exchange for their investment. So you say you want to, you believe in, you know, a film about making pies or you believe in a film about changing the world through, you know, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to get some good examples here. I'm having a, a challenge, but you believe it, you believe in a greener planet. So someone made a film about that. So you give them $50,000 in exchange, you get a part of ownership in that film. And then you, you, in theory, will receive revenue, a portion of the revenue generated by the film. But it's oftentimes these films, in terms of their revenue generation, um, are not as, as profitable. It's kind of speculative. But the, the bigger challenge for you as a filmmaker, what you got to think about is what kind of investors are you going to be more inclined to work with, active investors or passive investors? The reason why this distinction is important because if there's if you're an active investor, that basically means that as a filmmaker or producer, it's going to be a lot less expensive for you to propose this investment opportunity to this active investor. An active investor would be like another producer on your project, someone who's actively involved in the production of the project. Now, if you want to engage passive investors, that's a much more complex path because it's going to involve a lot of work and a lot of money. Passive investors, um, or better yet, making a, a, a providing an investor with a with a passive investment in your property is going to trigger what we what is known are as securities regulation laws because you're selling by providing equity in your project to someone who's not working on it, you're giving them a passive investment in a speculative business endeavor. And because of that, the government wants to protect people. That is, they want to protect investors from being exploited. And the way they do that is they, they've, they've created all of these regulatory guidelines and requirements so that the investor is fully aware of what they're investing in and they are fully aware of any inherent risks in that investment. But for you as a filmmaker or producer, it means you have to comply with tons of complex regulations that are going to just hike up the costs. I mean, you could easily spend, you know, you could easily spend a hundred thousand dollars in trying to navigate and properly follow these guidelines. So the regulatory compliance is expensive. It takes it's, it's very administrative intense, you know, very paper intense. And again, it can be very, very um, complex. So if you're taking the path of providing ownership in your property, to someone who is not working on the property, be careful. Because if you don't follow the regulatory guidelines, you literally can end up in prison. The people have gone to prison for failing to properly disclose the risks in their property, in their film property to investors and not, not filing and, and, and registering the property correctly. So basically, without getting into a tons of, of complex details about this, when you are making a security, when you're creating a security by allowing someone to invest in your property, what you're really doing is you are creating a um, requirement that you uh, follow public offering disclosures, right? So it's like kind of like when a, a stock goes public, you're making, you have to make that investment public. You don't, there's an exception when you don't have to do that, which is called a private offering. But if you take the private offering route, which is the route you definitely should take, obviously, if you don't have tons of capital and tons of expertise on your team to, to do this, then you need to look for which private placement, I mean, private offering um, exception you can qualify for in order to do this. So when you make the offering, it's called a private placement offering because it's not public. And if it's gonna be private, then it has to qualify for one of a number of private placement exceptions 
to registering it as a public offering, okay? And as a part of creating that private placement offering, you have to create what's, a, what's called a private placement memo, advising your investors of the potential risk, uh, the economic viability, uh, the likelihood that they will not receive their, their return on their investment. And all of this is required by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Again, just the, just the thing to remember is it is a general prohibition against advertising and soliciting investments, generally speaking, unless you can qualify for one of these statutory exemptions. So there are a number of exemptions. There's Regulation D, there's Regulation A+, uh, there's some others we will cover as well. And each of these exemptions have guidelines that you have to follow, not as stringent and as rigorous as if you were making a public offering, but challenging nonetheless. So again, what you, if you going down the path of a private placement or a private offering, then you have to take the path of creating a private placement memo and as well identifying which regulation or statutory exemption you can avail yourself of for the purposes of allowing people, uh, better yet allowing investors, passive investors to invest in your film. Out of all of the various regulations, Regulation D, Regulation A+, you know, the most practical one, we haven't gotten to that one yet, is Regulation CF. But before we do that, I just wanna point out that when you go into these Regulation D or Regulation A+, there's gonna be parameters under which you can basically pitch or invite investors, private investors into your, uh, into, into investing into your project, but it will be based upon them being either accredited and meaning they, they qualify under a certain profile as being equipped to make this kind of decision because of their experience level in, in an investment or the amount of capital that they have, um, their net worth, so, and then you also got to have to make sure that you don't exceed the caps. That is the total amount of money that your film is allowed to, to be in order for you to take investment under one of these exemptions. But, um, but exemption under the exemption under regulation D and regulation A plus are relatively high, but the most practical exemption is regulation CF. Now the cap under this is pretty low. It's only like a little over a million dollars because a million, million seventy, a million seventy thousand dollars or something like that. It's a, it's not extremely a large amount of money. So, but again, if you're making a film under a million dollars and you're likely going to want to avail yourself of this regulation in particular, it, you can, it allows you to defer a lot of the startup costs. It's a lot less expensive. It allows you to, to solicit meaning offer the investment to both accredited and non-accredited investors. That, that is investors who meet a certain uh, economic profile because of the annual income that they have or the assets they have, as well as people who do not have to meet that particular profile. So this is really affordable and practical solution for the indie film space. And then you have platforms that will support your equity crowdfunding offering. This is a this is to name a few of them. Of course, they all will take a, a cut out of the money you raise, but you will be able to avail yourself of expertise and resources and marketing um, that you may not have access to if you're doing this with a small, very small or inexperienced team. Now, last but not least, we should talk, we're gonna talk about the like the, the marriage between financial technology and the film industry. And this is in the space of cryptocurrency. Well, cryptocurrency can be an elusive uh, title. A lot of times people get confused about what it means, what, what is cryptocurrency. So we're gonna take some time to really like try to give you some analogies to break this down so it can make, so it can make sense. So when you think about cryptocurrency, think about casino chips and casino chips that are being used at a casino. So cryptocurrency will be the, the chips and the casino will be this tech platform called blockchain. So outside of the casino or outside of blockchain, the cryptocurrency or the tokens 
right, the chips have zero relevance. But inside the casino, inside blockchain, the cryptocurrency, again, all the casino chips are able to be operated as currency in this environment. So what are tokens? What are these casino chips? How are they, how are they created and what are they? Well, tokenization is, is a process of transferring ownership of an actual asset or a utility into a digital representation of that asset or utility, right? I.e. a digital token. So say for example, you want to share ownership of your house with a friend or family member, but you want to do it in the digital, you know, cryptocurrency structure. Then there's a process, you go through the process called tokenization, right? And you would transfer the ownership of that asset, that house, into this digital representation so that 50% of it is owned by you and 50% of it is owned by the other party. That particular token would be considered a security token because it's backed up with an actual physical asset. Unlike another scenario where if you say, well, you know, I own a movie theater and I want to let family and friends, you know, come for free on Friday nights, right? Then that would be considered a utility token and it would operate like a coupon redeemable for access to your movie theater on Friday's nights. Different from security token is the utility token is not backed up by an actual asset. So it has zero foundation in an asset. It's purely based on a utility, a utilitarian purpose. And it is usually used to fund the startup costs for a business. Then you have currency or transactional tokens like Bitcoin is a good example of this, which isn't tied to any asset at all. It, its value is defined by the platform that created it. Okay, but you use it like actual money to transact a business inside of a blockchain community. So in order to get to the place of a security token, we, you, you have to go through the process of a security token offering. And we discussed this a moment ago where this is how you begin before you start the tokenization process. So basically, it's the same security regulations that apply to the equity investment in your film. All the same regulations, all the same exemptions. And it's a pretty popular um, mode of, of investment. It was really, really popular years ago uh, when the ICO boom the, that is the the initial coin offering boom took place. But we'll get into that a little later in the presentation. But again, as as I pointed out here, it's called a security token offering process (STO), and these tokens um, are tethered to real assets. Um, the film there's a film coming out about the Atari video console and the games, and they're using security tokens and raised fully 40 to 50 million dollars doing it. So this is a popular path for um, raising capital in the film space through cryptocurrency. Again, Bitcoin is the most popular one. So we'll look at that a little bit closer. So Bitcoin is global, right? Those of you who aren't aware of it, it's a global way to transact business. It's extremely efficient. It's considered trustworthy because there's no central authority governing the transaction, right? So for example, if you do, if you transact money through Apple Pay or PayPal, the difference with that, that's, that's not considered a cryptocurrency because there's a central banking authority that's at the center of that transaction. You can't give me money, I can't give you money, at least not in the digital form, unless it goes through a bank right unless your bank you know more or less approves it whether it's cash app or Venmo, or my bank receives it it's but with crypto there is no central banking authority i'll explain that to you with this graphic so in crypto i mean in the traditional transactions as you see in this graph you have a central banking authority between all of the parties transacting money but in crypto you don't you have a what's called the distributed ledger which really basically is a record of the transaction 
that everyone has and shares without there having to be any intermediary in the transaction, which is which is why it allows for a certain amount of anonymity when, when making crypto transactions. Here's some examples of the properties of having a distributed ledger, again, or this digital record. You know, it's extremely secure. It's really hard to infiltrate a blockchain platform. I, I, mean, I think it's nearly impossible, some might say. All the participants in the transaction are aware of the transaction at the same time. So there's pure transparency amongst the parties. And you can never spend the same dollar twice. There's a record, an uh, immutable record that valid that's validated and, and tracks the transaction. So you can't duplicate the transaction. So the way I would think about blockchains, I know it's a confusing concept. I would think about blockchain as this. The blocks are consisted of the digital information, the digital records, and then the chains are kind of the super highway connecting those records, right? So the block is a digital record of this ledger, this, this, this transaction took place. And then the chains connect these blocks in that universe that you're part of on the blockchain. It's extremely safe and practical because there's the information is decentralized. So it's in the hands of only the people that are part of the transaction. There's no outside authority or other entities that have access to it. It reduces costs by eliminating that central authority and all the data and records are stored, are encrypted and stored on this, this distributed ledger. So blockchain platforms facilitate transactions by digitally programmed security tokens with the information prescribed on the purchase terms, right? So basically imagine a, a, a dollar bill that had a computer chip in it and the computer chip told the dollar bill when to, when to, <laughs> um jump in the hands of the person that you wanted to for, so they can spend it in some kind of way shape or form or when to you know like restrict itself from being spent what region of the world it should go to versus what region of the world it should not go to so that's what's called a smart contract so each crypto currency transaction is facilitated through this smart this computer chip inside of the dollar bill or inside of the 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 the, the, uh, the token essentially so smart contracts are the brains of digital tokens that execute the token commands right so in the the command might be you know sell 20 percent of my film rights to george lucas right if that's if it was a security token but it also could like i said earlier be programmed as a utility token which is not backed up with an asset and the, the programming could say, you know, provide this list of people with a 50% discount on my movie premiere. This is another example of showing how the smart contracts operate. These are pieces of code that live on the blockchain and execute the commands exactly how they were prescribed. They can make decisions, read the contracts, send tokens to various people, execute all of the expectations of this agreement you entered into without you doing anything else other than what you programmed the token to do or the contract to do. So this is an example of how a transaction actually makes its way onto the blockchain. It starts out with you having a, uh, a digital wallet though. Okay, and then you request a transaction, right? I wanna send John Doe $50,000, right? So a block representing that transaction is created then it's sent to all the participating participating parties. In this case, it's only you and one other person. Then what's called uh, the a node is sent to validate the transactions of the people who are they're called miners. Basically, uh, I guess you would consider them extremely, you know, extremely well trained uh, tech wizards are verifying the transaction to make sure that they can approve it, that's valid, and it's um, should be added to the blockchain, the existing blockchain. And then that, get, that new block gets distributed 
as a part of the entire network and the transactions being complete. So financing via crypto versus financing via fiat currency, this is just comparing, you know, the two worlds. So traditional financing, there's a small group of in industry insiders. It's hard to get access to financing opportunities when you are not someone who has the right contacts or a, a huge deep pocket for investment. But in crypto, this could open up a whole new asset class of investors without those barriers to entry, meaning, you know, level of wealth and, and, and contacts. You know, traditional financing happens more or less in paper contracts or, you know, e emails, a digitized version of an agreement. But in crypto, it's all done in smart contracts. So the, the traditional financing path is highly administrative and very expensive. And obviously crypto is the very opposite. And then the risks are, are hugely mitigated. There's very little risk in crypto because of the, the cryptography encoding all of the transactions. But in traditional financing, there's, there's, there's uh, tons of ways to, uh, to, to corrupt your transaction. So this is giving you a little bit of history of, you know, the token offerings and the regulatory landscape over the past few years. I mentioned earlier that the ICO market was a huge, was a booming market, but regulators came in and basically shut that down because a lot of people were being exploited. A lot of business was being exploited and a lot of underhanded transactions were taking place. So ultimately right now, um, you know, the only path for a, a truly a true a, a security offering uh, of, of the nature we've describing in this film sector would be through the security token offering, SDO offering. So again, blockchain saves money, cuts costs, and allows projects like film to be much more profitable. These are some of the platforms or businesses that are engaging in digital assets and building a market for digital assets. So as I mentioned earlier, the Atari movie that's being you, that's being tokenized and raising funding, it's gonna be, uh, I mean, I'm not sure where it is right now considering you know, the, the impact of COVID, but, um, but this is one of the bigger projects that were, was on the, on the horizon. You know, and the other people are in the space as well. Ryan Kavanaugh has got his coin. A lot of, lot of investors are, in, are looking at this as a way to offset costs of, of financing films, but, but also make uh, opening up the market for more revenue generation. Now, what does all of this really mean and why is it all really relevant? Well, here's the point in, in the context of the film business. You know, if you wanted to, if you were a fan of Wonder Woman, which made 821 million, or Black Panther, which made over a billion dollars, if you felt like these movies, you know, early on were gonna be successful, there would be no way to invest in them. There would be no way to, to, to say, I wanna own a part of that, I mean, Black Panther, I wanna own a share in Wonder Woman. It would be impossible because Hollywood doesn't operate that way. There's no market to invest in intellectual property. You'd have to invest in the companies that own these properties, right? And you, which means you couldn't access the revenue from these pro projects without them being filtered through layers and layers of these organizations and major studios, the five of them that own most of the major blockbuster movies. So this is just showing you where the revenue generation comes from when we're making individual films. But you could touch under this at all. Again, this is showing you kind of the waterfall of money and how it flows from the generate the distributors and the streaming services and the, the pay TV platforms that generate it from the exhibition of it, the distribution of it down to the actual studio or studio partner or investor. This is giving you another example of what these films look like um, when you're dealing with large budgets, right? 30 million for film gross and 75 million. And also identifying how, you know, how the fees just eat away at the, at the games, right? You're seeing on the left hand of this graphic distribution fees, sales agent costs, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really, 
a very uh, in- expensive endeavor to distribute a film through the traditional model and expect a return on your investment as a uh, investor or producer. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the big five studios control 90% of the market. Comcast, which owns Universal, Viacom, which, is, which owns Paramount, AT&T, which owns tw- um, uh, Warner Brothers, Disney, which now owns both 20th Century Fox, as well as Disney Studios. These are the, if you wanted to invest in Batman or Wonder Woman, you'd have to invest in one of these, the companies that were producing the films. You couldn't invest in individual projects. But that's all changing now with the whole idea of having a secondary market for these equity investments in films. We're on the verge of having our own, our very first basically film exchange or market to exchange equity in films that doesn't exist today, and it, but it will exist tomorrow. Which means if you own you know, Wonder Woman, you can take, take that investment in Wonder Woman, whatever the share is, and trade it in a marketplace with someone else for another film or for, or for cash for the value of the investment. If you were investing in the, if you were investing in the film as a filmmaker or a producer or a passive investor, you'd spend up to seven years waiting to get a return on your investment, which would be crazy, right? But with the secondary market, your investment becomes automatically liquid. As a as a equity investor in a cryptocurrency funded film, you'd be able to liquidate invest that investment and get your money out of it within a matter of weeks or days versus years. So in essence, equity crowdfunding through crypto is going to change the film game, right? It's going to open up the market for what we call retail investors, everyday people, to directly invest in content creation and production. Um, so the next Oscar contender could be a film you have an ownership stake in and could liquidate that ownership stake if it's valuable to you and trade it with someone else. And as well as it's going to open up a whole new opportunity for investors who don't want to wait to liquidate their investments five to seven years. They may, you know, investors that want to immediate liquidity and want to get out of that investment to invest their funds in something else. This is equity crowdfunding and crypto is it will offer these opportunities. So in essence, cryptocurrency uh, through blockchain is bound to change every aspect of the film finance and our content ecosystem, provided certain technological uh, innovations take place and our perspectives about blockchain and cryptocurrency evolve. Otherwise, um, we'll never see the true rise of the working class venture capitalists and indie producers will be left without many options. So I hope you enjoyed that presentation and I look forward to hearing your feedback. Be sure to follow me on uh, my YouTube page, uh, the Brooklyn Boardroom, or one of the social media platforms at uh, BKLYN Boardroom. Cheers.